wait a minute, how the hell does nobody know about this? You know, yeah. talc, the, something that I can go out and get right now at the pharmacy could cause cancer. And yeah. I didn't know about this until I started working on this project. That and so much more coming right up on today's episode of The Pod Spotter. Hi, you're listening to The Pod Spotter. I'm your host, Zach Robodas, and there are too many pods out there for you to listen to, but I got you. I got your back. I'm going to do it. I'm going to find the diamonds in the rough, and I'm going to listen to them, and every Monday, I'm going to talk to the creators and the hosts and learn about their pods and bring you some highlights. So subscribe to our little pod. Visit thepodspotter.com and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at The Pod Spotter, and there you'll find extra content and info on upcoming shows. Twitter, Instagram. It's really yeah. a pleasure. I've been screening hundreds of podcasts. When you're the oldest baby company in the world, you learn something important. Babies grow up. They fall down. They have fevers. They break bones. Some develop acne, allergies, and nearsightedness. They need to be stitched up, given a chance against HIV and protected from the sun. They have ups and downs and babies of their own. Sometimes they go to dark places and need help getting back. That's why we're not just a baby company. No, we're a keep you healthy your whole life company. And from the day you're born, we never stop taking care of you. No, the Pod Spotter does not have a new sponsor. That is copy from a commercial for Johnson & Johnson that you can find on YouTube from 2019. The very same year, Johnson & Johnson accumulated roughly 14,000 lawsuits related to its use of talc in what is widely considered the keystone of its company, Johnson & Johnson's Baby Powder. If J&J were to settle all of its talc-related lawsuits, it would cost the company an estimated $4 billion. But could that figure have been avoided had the company acted on information it received some 50 years ago? Information laid out masterfully in the investigative journalism podcast, Verified Dust Up. Joining me to discuss the second season of Verified and all things Dust Up related is host Natasha Del Toro. Natasha, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your pod with us today. Yes. Thank you for having me. That was quite an introduction. Oh, fun for me to get to go back to my uh, voiceover uh, radio audition roots. (laughs) You've seen these copies a million times and you're like, oh my God, how do I... Not yep. lay on the schmaltz here. It is a good ad, actually, if you watch that All ad. their ads are good. They have a lot of money to put into advertising. There's a reason why we remember the songs, all the jingles from Johnson & Johnson, Baby Powder, and Shower to Shower, because they're effective. Yeah. And then you listen to your podcast, and you're like, where is the disconnect here, folks? Uh, Natasha, why don't we just start with just an introduction uh, sure. from you before we get too deep into it. How would you introduce yourself if you were before a grand jury? <laughs> um, <laughs> I am Natasha Del Toro. I am a journalist. Um, I have worked in, I work in television, documentary, and now podcasts. Um, I've been doing investigative reporting for the last uh seven years and how would you describe the second season of verified to someone who hasn't heard second season um the second season which is vastly different from the first season is about uh this product that we all grew up with that we all trusted i mean my mom dusted me from head to toe in johnson and johnson baby powder and um, finding out now through uh, the efforts of these women who took Johnson & Johnson to court because they developed ovarian cancer, finding out that the company knew about um, asbestos and the dangers related to um, talc 
way back in the 70s. Hmm. And it's about their effort to cover it up. Um, and it's about these women who fought. I mean, after they went through everything they went through with ovarian cancer, um, one of, you know, not all of them made it. Um, because of their fight against Johnson & Johnson, this major pharmaceutical company, um, we have information now about the internal, you know, all these internal documents from the company. You you mentioned your mom dusted you. What journalists maintain sort of that impartial sort of, uh, I'm not going to get emotional about this, but this, this could, had to be personal for you. I mean, you know, you think about like, drinking, smoking, eating fast food, or like whatever number of things that people do on a daily basis that could be bad for their health. Um, and, you know, to find out that baby powder of all things, which seems like the most innocent mm. product, it's like I, I associate it with babies and innocence and purity. Um, mm. So to imagine that that product of all things could cause cancer is, you know, is worrying. Yeah, the, I, it's not a huge part of my family's culture and tradition, but it is, like you said, it's just in there. You know, it's just in, it like comes with medicine cabinets. It is the state. Yeah, like, everybody's got a bottle it, of it in their home. I was thinking um, a lot about the, just the sort of advertise. Like they'd mentioned it's not their hottest seller, but the advertising they get from that bottle, just being a part of someone's life, you know, just being in there, them seeing the brand, them seeing the Johnson & Johnson label every day, like, Yep. Boom, like that is, yeah, we you all can't know quantify it, the worth of that. We all know what that bottle looks like. We all know what that bottle smells like. You know, we all know what the powder smells like. Um, and it's just one of those things that it really, it was really shocking to learn that, that there could be something wrong with it. And that, you know, for women, the women in our story used it every single day for 30 years. Yeah. You know, my family is from Puerto Rico and in Hispanic culture and in African-American culture, people use it more. You know, mm. I think that it's something it is cultural and especially for lower income people who didn't have um, air conditioner. <laughs> it was a way in hot cultures, hot climates. Mm. It's a way for people to stay uh, cool. Yeah, that. we'll definitely get into the sort of insidious way that these people targeted. The marketing, the marketing, the marketing aspects is of it so gross. Like, but I, yeah. I, I want to hammer down, well, not hammer down, I want to just uh, clarify a bit um, about the science. And so I kind of want to go a little bit out of order sure. and start with your, your episode four, where you really yep. get into just what talc is. While traveling through the Rocky Mountains by train, Robert Wood Johnson struck up a conversation with the railway surgeon. This is from a video J&J put out to celebrate the company's history. The surgeon said that railroad workers were often injured from accidents in remote areas and far away from medical help. Robert listened, and in response, Johnson & Johnson created the first first aid kits. The video describes how these kits included sterile bandages and medicated plasters, sort of like early Band-Aids. The problem was, people started getting rashes. The plasters irritated their skin. So Johnson listened again. But instead of changing the plasters, he sent them another product, tins of talcum powder to soothe the irritation. Consumers replied that not only did the powder soothe the irritation from the plasters, it also soothed their baby's diaper rash. So. In 1894, Johnson's baby powder was put on the market, giving birth to our baby products business. It's a, it's amazing that like baked into the lore is already this sort of like transfer of responsibility. The workers really liked it and they tried it on the babies. And so we were like, hey, whatever. <laughs> they wanted it. You want it? Great, take it. And the second thing that strikes me about it is that like, yeah, they didn't just alter the thing that wasn't working. They create a second Another product. product. <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> fucking brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, right. Yeah. 
and it's been gross. around. Is this since story the real? Beginning. Did you look into this this sort of folklore behind the yeah, origin oh, yeah. of baby powder? Yes, yeah. and actually, the it's, section that you played is a section that we worked on. We we wrote carefully, um, and it was fascinating to they they do have this sort of company lore, yeah. and when you go, you can go on their website, and there's like a museum that'll take you back, and there's like a little train, like choo choo train, that takes you back in history. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the other thing that we drilled down on was the the credo. I mean, we do believe that Robert Wood Johnson, um, it, he was an exceptional guy. They called him the general, and he did a lot of good things back then in the 30s, whenever it was that he was alive. And, um, you know, their, their credo was really about making customers, uh, putting them first, putting their, their health and their safety making that their number one priority, which is a pretty great thing now when you think about like corporations that are all about bottom line. In this case, Johnson & Johnson was really saying, no, we are going to put our customers first. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, they've, they've come a long way from, from their credo. Yeah. And why, uh, what, well, what is talc exactly? Talc, um, so talc is a mineral that you, it's, you mine talc, um, and it is mined in the same place as, as asbestos. Okay. So that's where the asbestos issue comes in. I didn't know Geographically, this, so. the mines are on top of each other or the, the minerals need to, they just automatically grow together because of the they nature. They grow of, together. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. So you'll see like a, a uh, like a ribbon of asbestos running through the talc. I mines. see. I so it's see. It's just very difficult when you're mining for this stuff. I mean, talc is, it's a fine powder that's actually a crushed, it's like crushed rock, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so fine. And it's the most absorbent uh, product that you can find. Um, but what is uh, a problem, what's problematic is that it's very, very difficult to mine for talc and guarantee that you're not um, also picking up asbestos in Got the powder. It. Got it. Uh, and yeah. it is allegedly dangerous uh, because if it's applied to the you know perineum for years and years and years, uh, you, you, people are, are finding that they're developing ovarian cancer from this talc. Yeah. Well, and here's the, allegedly here's a, I, right? like the science is still, no matter, there seems to have been thousands and thousands of tests and we still don't know causation or correlation, right? Correct. Uh, and it's difficult when you're talking about cancer to really pinpoint what could be the cause of cancer. And what one particular scientist, um, Kramer, who we interview in the first few episodes, who studied for years whether talc, you know, how exactly it is that talc itself could cause ovarian cancer. And his, you know, based on his studies, this the talc that you're sprinkling in your, you know, in your underwear for hygienic reasons, um, that talc could actually uh, travel up the ovarian tract and irritate the ovaries and the irritation over time is what could cause uh, cancer cells to develop. Got it. There's two points here. One is talc itself dangerous is mm -hmm. talc could talc itself, even if it doesn't have asbestos, could that cause cancer? And there are some studies that say talc could cause cancer because it, is an ir it could be an irritant mm. in certain studies that have been done on ovarian uh, cancer tissues they found talc particles in these ovarian cancer tissues so that was that's one question so put that over in one box the other question would be about asbestos and we know we know asbestos Science is carcinogenic yeah yep. So, and often, you know, there've been studies after studies where they test powder and they find asbestos in powder. And even if it's just a very, very small amount, I mean, even in small amounts, asbestos is highly carcinogenic. And if you are one of the people that has those genes that it could trigger um, cancer, it's not going to happen for everybody, but it happens for for some people who have this, those genes. 
the most unusual and useful mineral fiber known to man. Largely unseen, seldom recognized, it has played a tremendously important role in the improvement of our standard of living. As you might expect, the Greeks had a name for it. They called it the unquenchable, indestructible stone. They called it asbestos. How long exactly have you guys been working on this season? I'll tell you a little bit about our production. Um, we have an audio engineer named Dan Bloom, our executive producer, Suzanne Reber, and then me. Um, on this project, we also had a reporter, um, Sandra Bartlett. She's an investigative reporter who has been working on this for years, actually. I think for like two years, she's been oh, digging wow. into all of the, the the documents. I mean, there are like two million company documents. I mean, she hasn't looked at all of them, obviously, but she's the one that's really, she did the deep dive into the trove of these documents. Then I came on board in June of this, mm. in, in the middle of in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I came on and started working on this story as well and helping to report and doing interviews um, with our whistleblower. We talked to um, the um, attorney general, former attorney general of Mississippi, who's filing lawsuits against Johnson and Johnson, and a, and you know a bunch of other characters that appear in our documentary, and we just released our final episode on Monday. It's seven. It's, it's seven episodes, right? Seven episodes. Correct? Yep. There was more that we could. I, I can only imagine how many more victims that you could have. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Right. Well, there's so many lawsuits. I think there was like, there's like 22,000 lawsuits right now. Oh my gosh. Against Johnson and Johnson. Um, Is that just yeah. for, uh, that's not, but that's uh, for talc and various other, that's like their hip thing. And they have like a couple other sort of. Oh no, just for talc. Blood yeah. thinners. I know also have a number of uh, litigation. Oh yeah. It, but just they, for talc I mean, is 22,000. Yeah. yeah. Wow, wow, there's wow. 22,000 lawsuits just for talc. And the judgments against them have been enormous. You know, to me, I would think, oh, well, this is going to put this company out of business. This has got to be like an existential threat to this company. But actually, you know, they make $80 billion a year. So they keep chugging along. And and now they have gotten so much money for the COVID vaccine, you know, which is their next thing. You know, so I, I didn't know if I wanted to talk about that because... Yesterday was a big day here. You know, the FDA had to vote on the efficacy of uh, the vaccine. And 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 Johnson & Johnson is in the race. And we learned yep. from your pod that Johnson & Johnson is a bully and can bully around the FDA. And that's oh. kind of scary given right. <laughs> they're in the race. Yeah. Yeah, it does make you um, think twice about it. Um, and especially when we're talking about the vaccine. I mean, this obviously COVID has upended all of our lives. So we really want this vaccine. Uh, we want this vaccine to work. Um, but what I will say is that there is much more regulation around um, medicine and pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. FDA regulations than there are for cosmetics. That's got one it. of the big issues here. Got so it, I think it, you it, could it. probably okay. feel more safe when it yeah. comes to the the pharmaceuticals. Then. Got it. It was just a big wow moment for me listening to your pod uh, when we learned just how powerless the FDA actually is. Natasha, in the hundreds of J&J &J documents I've looked at, I've never seen concerns raised about endangering their customers. I can't say what was in their hearts, but what they were writing about constantly was the concern about protecting what they called the cornerstone of the baby products franchise. And they frequently disputed tests that said their powder contained asbestos. And just like they said to the scientists, they told the FDA, let us do our own tests and we'll tell you if there's really any asbestos in talc. What? Wait, what? Let us do our <laughs> own tests and we'll tell... So you're saying that's because uh, cosmetics are, diff are treated differently. It, it goes back to a law from 1938, which is, you know, outdated by this point. Um, and this law from 1938 is what regulates cosmetics. And there's like, there's literally like three pages of regulations for cosmetics. Um, my brother, I don't want to throw him under the bus, <laughs> uh, but he worked at the FDA for a long time. And he's the one when I was getting into investigative reporting, you know, years ago, he said, you should look into this. This is strange. This is a $300 billion, you know, it's like a massive industry in the United States and around the world. But in the U.S., um, 
there is very little regulation around the products that we use to wash our hair, deodorants, creams, lotions. You know, this is all stuff that um, the, the industry themselves, they self-regulate. We rely on them to do the studies and they're, they don't have to um, prove anything before it goes on the market. You know, it's more like after the fact, once it's already on the shelves, that's when the FDA can put, you know, they can pull a product or put a warning label on it. But at that point, it just seems like it's a little bit too late, you know? Yeah. I, I think one of the issues, there's been a bill that has, I think it's been like, um, circulating for years and years. It's a bipartisan bill, Susan Collins and Diane Feinstein. Has, they proposed this bill to give the FDA more regulatory authority over cosmetics. Hmm. Um, and there was a congressional hearing that we included in our documentary as well, um, looking at baby powder specifically. Um, and year after year, it doesn't get, it just doesn't pass. Um, you talk about in this episode, fi final point on, on episode four and all of Sandra's really awesome work was the, we learned about the sort of the smoke screening that goes on in these labs and the, the way they sort of gaslight and discredit the tests that do happen. So the researcher that Jane J hires thinks there's talc in the ovarian tissue and he also finds asbestos in the tissue. Yeah. Big deal. Right. And he wanted to publish a paper on the results. But J&J &J wrote him a two-page letter pointing out all the reasons that wasn't a good idea. The big one, they said, was an issue with the Welsh lab. It wasn't as clean as it should be. And none of the results were reliable, including his. J&J &J said in the letter that publishing his findings would have, quote, limited scientific value. Yeah, so how many times have you heard this party line used this uh, la unclean labs? So there yeah. is oversight, there is testing going on, they're looking into this, but there's all this discrediting and misinformation at the same time. This has been going on for four decades. Um, they find asbestos in the talc, um, they discredit the labs, they say the scientists are, you know, they had, this was something that we talked about in episode four too. Johnson Johnson actually had developed um, they were keeping track of the scientists who were doing work in this area and they called it their antagonistic personalities. You know, they were tracking these people that were just scientists that were trying to get, you know, information out to the public about the safety of talc. And so they were watching these people and trying to discredit them. And then also with these labs saying the labs were unclean and, you know, where we end up, and I don't, I don't want to give anything away for anybody who hasn't heard the podcast, but where we end up um, by episode seven is like, is this stuff safe? Is mm. it not safe? <laughs> okay. how, can, how can after four decades, we not know a definitive answer, you know, like, is talc dangerous? And if it is dangerous, why is it on store shelves at all? Yeah. There's three different methods of testing and it's none of them are perfect, you know? And so there can be arguments, there can be debate about like, well, does this stuff contain asbestos or not? So it's not that black and white. It's not that easy to, to actually say definitively, yes, it is. No, it's not. And Johnson and Johnson has used that to their advantage. But what we, what we learned and looking in the documents is that they were very aware hmm. that there was asbestos in the talc. And um, during this time, you see Johnson & Johnson in the memos, they started experimenting with cornstarch. Um, in the 70s? Created, in the 70s, they had cornstarch that early? They developed it in the late 60s, actually. Guys, come they developed on. a cornstarch version around this time when people became very aware. There was this awareness that asbestos was bad for you. Talc and asbestos are related. Um, there were studies about talc being dangerous if you could inhale talc. They were very, very aware of all of this. One of the parts in the re research that struck me the most was that they actually sued they, they threatened to sue the FDA in the 70s um, when the FDA said they were going to publish information and they were going to potentially uh, require a warning on talc. 
if you're still here, if you're not angry and haven't thrown the headphones off, uh, <laughs> that, or if you haven't gone and, and started to binge Verified already, that is a bit about the history of talc and the smoke screening and all that stuff. But the first half of your pod really hangs on this cool courtroom drama story uh, and the tragedy of Dean Berg, uh, her, her yeah. awful story. Who, who's Dean Berg? Dean Berg is an incredible woman. She's a fighter. Um, she is a physician assistant. Um, she used baby powder for 40 years of her life um, and went in for a checkup and uh, was surprised to find out that she had ovarian cancer. Um, now, because she had medical knowledge, you know, she started this process of like, well, what, you know, she led a very healthy life. She didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she ate healthy, didn't have any family history of cancer, of ovarian cancer. Um, and so in this process of trying to figure out what, what could have caused her ovarian cancer at age 49, she came across a pamphlet, a Gilda Radner, you remember Gilda Radner? Um, yeah, it's, it's a crazy piece of audio here. Let's, uh, let's play it. I was flipping through here. What is ovarian cancer? What causes ovarian cancer? Because I began to say to myself, where did this come from? My mother doesn't have cancer. My father doesn't have cancer. No one in my family did except my two grandparents who smoked and got lung cancer. So I'm looking familial. No. Okay. Previous. No. High fat Western diet. No. Use of talc baby powder in genital area. What? So she has the great line about, I started thinking about my body like a crime scene. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's, and she starts just doing all this research. And well, I guess my question is, how did it get in the Gilda pamphlet? But it wasn't widely known. The short answer is, I have no idea. Why didn't more people know about yeah. this? If this was in Gilda Radner, you know, yeah. I have no no idea. You would think that something like this would be widely known. And I mean, and that's what Dean says. It's like, wait a minute, how the hell does nobody know about this? You know, if, yeah. if, if talc is something that I can go out and get right now at the pharmacy. Johnson & Johnson's supplier at the time, this company. Um, Lucinec. Uh, Thank you, yeah. Lucinec. Um, they had put a warning on their talc saying that it could cause, you know, perineal use could cause, um, you know, and possibly cause cancer. Yeah. So what is strange, and this is also talked about in the trial, is that Lucinec put their warning on their talc. They're the supplier for Johnson & Johnson. But for some reason, Johnson & Johnson decided not to put that same warning on the talc that it was selling to, to consumers. Yeah, I mean, I think it exists for most people as like, you get an update on your phone, <laughs> like Johnson & Johnson settlement for $40 million. You're like, oh man, that's, that's great. And then you kind of like go about your business, go about, and then until you like actually sit down with a podcast like yours and, and listen to the smoke screen and the gaslighting and the, and the years of denial and all this stuff that you're just like, what the shit? How do, why why yeah. isn't this story more known? Why isn't this out there? And, and, and it is out there now due in large to this woman, to Dean Berg, yeah, yeah, in her story. Dean Berg, um, this was in 2006. Uh, she decided to take Johnson & Johnson to court, um, which cannot be an easy thing to do. <laughs> I'm going to sue Johnson & Johnson. Um, and it was really, I think, um, synchronicity or serendipity, I should say, with um, this lawyer in Mississippi, Alan Smith, because he had been looking into these cases and he found her on an ovarian cancer survivor's portal. Like they were, you know, like a chat. And he finds her because she'd posted on uh, this ovarian cancer sort of survivor's um, page. Like, hey, I've been using baby powder. I found out in this, you know, the Gilda Radner pamphlet that maybe this could be the cause. Does anybody, is anybody else suspicious that this could have caused her cancer? And so he was the one that answered her 
um, her query. <laughs> and that's how they became connected. And they decided to go up against Johnson and Johnson. And um, she turned down a million dollar settlement in order to do this. I mean, that says a lot. Yeah. You get a real good idea of what they are up against uh, pretty early on in your pod, what her and Alan are, are up against this sort of David and Goliath story. Let's, let's meet David. I was a solo practitioner working in a thousand square foot office in Mississippi. And I get inundated with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages of internal emails, memos, documents, studies, all kinds of stuff. We printed and printed and printed uh, so that we would know what we wanted to use for trial for exhibits. Um, And there was so much, and we had to narrow it down as much as possible. A big law firm might have a whole team of people reviewing and sorting that kind of material. In this case, it was just Alan and Pat. (laughs) Alan, Pat, and Dean against these just lawyers, stacks and stacks of lawyers. Well, and he didn't even have enough money to ship his files wow, to Mississippi, wow, wow, so wow. they had to drive. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Johnson & Johnson legal team shows up, and I believe we found out that they they arrived in a jet, you know. <laughs> and for that lawsuit, I mean, it was incredible that they found J&J negligent mm. um, uh, of, you know, not informing uh, customers or consumers of the dangers of talc but they didn't award her any money unbelievable (laughs) they said so mrs berg we have come to the conclusion that most likely this talcum powder had nothing to do with your cancer but we are willing to pay you eight hundred thousand dollars now in exchange dean would have to agree to never speak publicly about the case or about her opinion that talc had caused her cancer. And I said, okay, are you going to put a warning label on the the talcum powder? No. Are you going to take it off the market? No. I said, so what was the purpose of this then? And they said, well, we just really don't want any of this getting out there. You know, this is to be kept hush. I can't believe the GoFundMe hasn't begun yet for her and for all of her legal bills and for everything. I think it starts here. God, start it for Dean because what she turned down, I mean, but subsequent, you know, people on her shoulders, people have been paid. Yes. Um, And we also tell the story of Jackie Fox. And and you're right, they could tell many stories because there have been a lot of lawsuits. But the second sort of biggest trial was the Jacqueline Fox trial. And she was um, a black woman who got ovarian cancer in her, I believe she was in her 60s, and also used baby powder her whole life, um, mm. and was fighting ovarian cancer and heard one of these ads, which we probably all either seen on um, line or heard on the television, you know, these ads for suing Johnson & Johnson for (laughs) baby powder. And she heard one of those and she was like, you know what, I'm going to call. I'm going to find out about this. And she decided, even though she was, again, battling ovarian cancer, she decided she was going to call and she was going to sue Johnson & Johnson in the last years of her life. Um, In that case, because of the marketing situation and some of the choices that uh, ovarian, um, that Johnson & Johnson made that really look evil um in light of you know what we know now um the jury awarded her she was awarded 72 million dollars um she was no longer she's no longer with us she died before that um award was made but johnson and johnson appealed the decision and so her family hasn't seen any of the money yet either so we'll you know we meet Jackie and Marvin in episode five in, in Snowball, and you start to get a, a, a sense of the, the larger scope of this thing, and you start to learn um, just how important J&J was to uh, the culture of black and brown communities. Just to make sure it was on me, she would put it on me herself. Underarms, anywhere that, that could be moisture or I'm going to sweat, my mom would have me walking out like a powder of smoke walking out the house on the way to church. 
baby powder was not just a part of his family. It was a part of his neighborhood. It's like, you know, if we went next door to borrow a cup of sugar from the neighbor, it was nothing to also go next door and say, hey, can I borrow your, your baby powder? We just ran out for the day. How did they, how did they eventually start targeting women of color and why did they start tar- targeting those communities? Right. Um, in the late 80s, um, Johnson & Johnson baby powder was starting to decline in sales. And they were trying to, and, and by this point, the health community was getting information out. Pediatricians were uh, recommending that women not use baby powder on their babies. Um, so they started looking at other revenue opportunities. You know, how are they going to boost the sales of their product? Um, and they knew that African American and Hispanic women were high users of baby powder. Um, they had all the, you know, done the internal sure. <laughs> um, studies on that. And so uh, there's a document from 1992 where they, uh, it, it was, when you read it, it's just really disturbing to see that they're like, well, you know, our sales are down. Uh, one of the reasons is probably due to this like, quote unquote, cancer linkage. But there's like these ethnic uh, we, you know, we want to investigate these ethnic opportunities targeting black and brown women, you know, or black and Hispanic women. And so then we saw these marketing campaigns that they um, developed targeting black women in the South, overweight women, women between 18 and 49, you know, so they were going after this, after this group. After we knew after they knew that there was a link between cancer and um, ovarian cancer and talc. Yeah. That, that episode for me, I think that was probably one of the, I actually, when I listened to it, I, I still get emotional um, uh, listening to it um, and hearing her voice. And we're working in reverse. We're working, we're reacting. And then exactly. it's, it's just, we're behind right. the whole thing. What is the fix? What's the salve? In <laughs> Europe, they have, more there are more chemicals that are banned we have so many chemicals in our products yeah. you know back in the 50s and 60s if you compare the amount of chemicals that we had then to now i mean it's just like thousands and thousands of chemicals and um i did read that in europe they are much better about banning mm. chemicals and trying to kind of preemptively protect consumers um i don't know if talc is talc is banned in europe mm. i don't know how much they actually um enforce that mm-hmm. but it is on their list of uh, products that are banned we can't expect a company to they have a motive they they're a profit motive yeah. so we can't necessarily expect them to self regulate and to trust the results but the That's, weird thing is as you mentioned so many times in your pod is there is a precedent for them actually doing that there is a precedent for them doing the oh, right, right thing and actually like putting the consumers first here in Chicago, what started as a series of mysterious unrelated deaths 48 hours ago has resulted in the biggest drug warning in U.S. history. It all began Wednesday morning when 12-year-old Mary Kellerman died. Within 12 hours, there were five people dead in suburban Chicago. A sixth would die later, all victims of extra-strength Tylenol capsules laced with cyanide. I'm actually old enough to remember that. I, I, don't, I don't remember this. This happened. What was this story? And JJ actually does the yeah, right thing here. Terrifying. They're like, let's go. Let's get this off. The-. They do, they go above what they're actually asked yeah. to do, right? Oh, completely. They removed all Tylenol from the shelves. Not just that batch, but they ended up recalling all of it. Hmm. And as a result of that incident, they developed um, the, the tamper-proof packaging that we know of today. Wow, wow, wow. So Dean wins her case. She's awarded no money, but other people can sue Johnson & Johnson as a result. Jackie is one of those people. Jackie right. sues her and her son Marvin win, but it's still an appeal. It's <laughs> an appeal. Right. And Johnson & Johnson has appealed all the big lawsuits against them. Yeah. So, I mean, this is still happening now, but there is a change happening um, because they have started to settle. I mean, this is really just in the recent, mm. you know, in the, uh, in the recent months in this year. Um, Johnson and Johnson announced in May that they were pulling uh, talc off the shelves. Got it. They're going to only now use the cornstarch product. Got it. 
I shouldn't say they're pulling it off the shelves. I'm saying they're going to discontinue the sales and let the other stuff just sort of run out. Whatever talc-based right. baby powder is still out there, they're going to let that still circulate until it gets all sold off. Um, and one of the things that another big change is that they have started to settle uh, bulk cases. <laughs> they want to settle. They don't want to take this to court. Wow. So that's that could that could indicate that they are going to take a different legal strategy moving forward. You mentioned they're they're letting it run out, but but all, but, but not overseas, right? Right. Yeah. And this was something <laughs> just else. Keeps, that, there's so many nails. This one's this one's a downer here, guys. I'm sorry. It's just is, getting I, I worse know. and worse. It's such a bummer, but it's like it needs to be. People need to talk about it. It's crazy. But Johnson and Johnson is still distributing their products with talc overseas in another country. And this is where the, it's kind of like the tobacco story too, that, you know, as uh, tobacco became less popular in the United States because of all the health risks that are known, um, they doubled down on selling it uh, overseas. Oh and God. so now we're seeing that with Johnson & Johnson talc based baby powder that they plan on selling it in developing world countries. They, they plan on selling it in... Um, India, Africa, Philippines. It just must be so cheap. It must be so cheap and abundant. Like, why are we using it? Well, I mean, they continue to, they s maintain that their talc is safe. Mm. So they're like, well, we're going to keep selling it. It's too much of a hassle to sell in the United States, I guess. <laughs> we got to lighten it up here. We got we to gotta lighten it up with a little listener question. This is Her Majesty Drew on Instagram. He wants to know uh, the breed of Dexter the dog. Now, this is Dexter the dog. This is Jackie's dog, the second victim that we hear about um, in, in, in your pod. And she was warned of her ovarian cancer early from her pup. She was standing in front of me, and he would cry. He want to jump up on me, and then I seen this guy on television say his dog had saved his life. So I told Dexter, I sit on my hands, told him to come up him. So he came, jumped up on me, and he was sniffing, just sniffing all around and crying. I said, something must be wrong with me. I called my girlfriend, and I told her, I said, Dexter acting strange. What an amazing animal! <laughs> what is the? We gotta find out. That's oh my an amazing god! I, you know, I'm. I don't know why I'm thinking it was a poodle, but I actually I think the only reason why I'm saying that is because oh, it's a, it was a poodle. Poodle. Oh Dexter my gosh! Was a poodle. That's crazy. Our neighbor's uh, cockapoodle. A, a years years ago when we had a, a earthquake here, the whole day before the earthquake he was just under the sofa and we were like what is going on with this dog i'm hanging out on the sofa all day and then the earth uh, earthquake hit it here in new york it was a, it was a poodle it was a cockapoodle and we we're like so oh my like it never went under this couch. it never went under the couch ever 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 but it sensed it coming they're wired on a different frequency and everyone they should are have totally wired on a different frequency i have a cattle dog who's mm. here right here you poppers talk, say hi you talk come that's Utah. She's uh -huh. she's not having it right now. But um, my my boyfriend has had many cattle dogs, and his mom had autoimmune diseases and would have seizures. And the dog would sense when she was going to have a seizure and oh would stand gosh. next to her so that she would be able to hold on to the dog when she was about to have the seizure, rather than falling onto the ground. There you so, go, everybody in quarantine getting dogs right now. Kettle dogs yeah. and, uh, and and cockapoodles. Yeah, <laughs> dogs are incredible. And uh, I just got a kitten, so I'm I'm all for pets. You're set. You're all set. Natasha, you're, uh, I, I don't know if you read this article in Deadline, how um, podcasts are the new sort of incubator for Hollywood movies. And I mean, there is an, an amazing ha courtroom drama, obviously, baked into your podcast. And so... I thought uh, for our game uh, for the show this week would be a, a little round of how well do you know your Hollywood courtroom dramas? Oh no! Uh, to prepare okay. you for your inevitable uh, stint in Hollywood with Dust Up the <laughs> Movie, starring Kathy Bates and Mark Ruffalo. Mar Mark Ruffalo plays Alan, probably right. I could see that. <laughs> I could see that. Who would be Dean Berg? I feel like maybe. 
That's Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates. That's what I was going to say. Oh, it's got to be Kathy Bates. Yeah. I was going to say the same <laughs> thing. That's well, great. You got to answer these questions correctly. I'm probably going to be terrible at this. People think like when, when I'm asked pop culture questions, they're like, are you living under a rock? And it's like, well, I just, I'm like, I'm like researching. I'm doing hardcore investigations all the time. Like yeah, yeah, down. Yeah. I need to lighten it up a little bit. Anyway. Okay. Shoot. Ask me. These questions, questions are all from 30 years ago. You're going to be fine. If you answer two out of three correctly, this uh, verified coaster will make it uh, onto the pod wall of fame. A uh, beautiful coaster here because after you uh, listen to the pod, you're going to need a drink and a stiff drink, and then you'll need to put uh, right on this, this year, beautiful coaster. So verified makes <laughs> it on the wall. If you can identify these Hollywood courtroom dramas. Number one, when a man with HIV is fired by his law firm because of his condition, he hires a homophobic small time lawyer as the only willing advocate for a wrongful dismissal suit. Philadelphia. Oh, baby. Softball. Softball. See, nothing to worry about here. How many questions are there? There's three. You got one. Okay. Just get okay, one more I correct. One. I got one out of three. I feel okay. Verified's <laughs> on the wall. You're not getting shut out. <laughs> Military lawyer Lieutenant Daniel Caffey defends Marines accused of murder. They contend. They were acting under orders. Oh, no. I'm putting it on the wall. I don't know. A few good men. Oh, you can't I handle can't, the okay. truth. You can't handle the truth. Come on. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> yeah. A few good men was number two. You got one. I get nervous and like my, I blank out because I know like you, I, you, you ghosted on that one. You, you, you had that one, but you were just like, nah, I don't, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. leaving. It was I, there. Like I should have given you more time, but I'm so confident you're going to get this third one that, uh, I was going to let that fly. Number three, two New Yorkers accused of murder in rural Alabama while on their way back to college, call in the help of one of their family members, a loud mouth lawyer with no trial experience. The family member is the cousin. My cousin Vinny? Oh, she got it. Two out of three. <laughs> there it is. My cousin Vinny, the Hollywood courtroom dramas. Answered two out of three correctly. Verified is going on the wall, That Natasha. is so exciting. Thank you for... <laughs> thank you for... <laughs> you had that one. Didn't look like you were Googling either. Congratulations. I was about to. I was like, will he notice if I'm... <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's take a quick break here. Uh, we'll be right back. We're here to fill the role of looking for great new content for you. If you like this show, please check us out. Subscribe. Visit thepodspotter.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at thepodspotter for lots of good stuff. And please leave a review and please leave a suggestion on a pod you want us to dissect. Subscribe, rate, review us on Apple Podcasts and help spread the word. We're going to release every Monday uh, with a great new pod and we're just going to keep plowing ahead whether you like it or not. So please leave us some notes, some suggestions, some heart emojis, whatever on any of those social media platforms. Natasha, I have to know, are you now, every time you go to a drugstore, I feel like there's probably a detour towards the, like the baby care aisle. To just see what is going on with Johnson and Johnson, because ever since I've started listening to your product, I have done it myself. Where I'm like, the two times I've been into a Dwayne Reed, I've been like, let me see what's going on over here. Cornstarch, it's all cornstarch now. But is that the rest of your life now? Or are you just going to kind of keep up on? Oh my them? gosh, I hope it's not. I hope it's not the rest of my <laughs> life. That would be depressing. Um, so I went to a few different pharmacies in Miami. I went to Target, Walgreens, uh, my grocery store, a few other places. And then I came to some <laughs> pharmacies in Tampa where I am now. And um, I did not find, I found only cornstarch in wow. in the pharmacies. However, I started looking online and it's still totally online. I found it on Walmart's website. You can buy the talc wow. powder. Yeah. So. Can I ask if you. I Johnson and Johnson products after working on this podcast. Do I have, I, I haven't bought a Johnson and Johnson product in a really long time. And now after this product, I don't think I, I would. 
Yeah. Um, although maybe that's a lie because Tylenol is a Johnson and Johnson product. It's sort of hard to avoid. I mean, I had to get it's band-aids. It's hard to avoid. And it was like, man, I've got do Johnson I get Johnson and Johnson, Johnson or do I get those, those off brand crappy ones? And I'm listening to your podcast. I'm like, I can't, I got to boycott these people, but man, do I not want to use a crappy bandaid? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> but like, <sighs> better not to use a bandaid at all. If it's better a crappy not to one. just bleed out, just bleed out. Yeah. Um, what do you, what, what would you recommend to someone who is a lifelong user of Johnson Johnson baby powder? No symptoms, no illnesses, anything like that. What should, what could someone like that's listening to this and be like, oh, that's been a part of my family for years. Um, I would say don't, uh, put the talc stuff, don't use it uh, in the genital, you know, in your underwear anymore. Yeah. I, I just don't think that's necessary. Um, I would probably chuck it, uh, buy the cornstarch version. There's no health risks associated with the cornstarch version. Mm. So I, I would probably say throw it away. Throw it away. Get some cornstarch, get the cornstarch version, use something else. And if you uh, need some incentive, uh, I just want to play the closest thing that we get to a confession and some closure. Um, you mentioned the CEO on the stand earlier, and uh, l- let's hear from the Johnson & Johnson CEO on the, on, the, on the stand here himself. Johnson & Johnson has always told the public there's no asbestos in Johnson's baby powder. Is that correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's correct. Now, what you can't do as you sit here, sir, is you cannot state under oath that there are no tests showing asbestos in Johnson's baby powder or its source talc. You cannot state that under oath, can you? That's correct. Okay, wait, what? So, okay, so these competing ideas I have a hard time keeping in my head. He can't say that um, there are no tests that prove a positive result for asbestos. But at the same time, he also says that those tests are bad. Or is that what it is? That the, the efficacy of those goes out the window. <laughs> That's what they do over and over again. Over and over again. I mean, at some point you're like, really? Why did? Why does this keep happening? What I, as the listener, I'm just like, why didn't the lawyer just say, well, sir, can I apply some Johnson Johnson baby powder circa 1980 to your perineum right now? Is that okay if I do that in court? <laughs> and then we'll see. We'll know. That would be splashy. That would definitely make a splash. Yeah. Yay, yay, yay. Well, they didn't, in that particular scene, the jury totally didn't buy Johnson & Johnson's argument. The CEO didn't do himself any favors by testifying that day because they awarded them like $178 million or, I mean, it was like- Was that a bulk? They actually was that broke- an, one of those bulk th- ones? Uh, four people four. were mm-hmm. suing Johnson & Johnson. This was for a me- mesothelioma case, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, they were trying to apply, determine punitive damages, extra, you know, like this was, they'd already ruled that Johnson & Johnson was guilty, but this was for extra bad conduct. Hmm. And when the CEO got up there and started, you know, uh, giving the company line, the, the jury just decided, no, this is, this is bullshit. And so what needs to happen here? What, how, how do we... The FDA, we, we lobby our congressmen to give the FDA more oversight. Is that how we fix all this? I think that's a start. Um, yeah. You know, for me, I have just become a lot more aware of the products that I'm using. I'm, I'm, I'm not assuming that just because it's on a store shelf that it's uh, entirely safe. So I'm, I'm, I'm really just, I'm, I'm asking more questions about what I. The products I use, I'm trying to use products that are more natural, which I think in general is I'm trying to use fewer products, <laughs> which I think is probably um, one step. But beyond that, I think it really is about um, trying to change the the regulation around these products. Mm. And that would be, uh, you know, legislation that that needs to to change this this law from 1938 that gives the cosmetics industry so much power and, you know, to, to self-regulate. I think that needs to be looked at and amended. Natasha, you helped ampl- amplify the, the voices of strong women um, in Italy to take down a uh, sexual predator. And now uh, women, uh, again, strong women to help, help them take down big pharma. Can you tease a season three of Verified for us? 
Oh, we have a few things in the works, but I don't think I I can't reveal it yet. I'm going to well, have to have it will be on brand thematically. Stay tuned. Yes, yeah. it is going to be um right right now we we haven't signed anything yet, but it mm. is going to be about uh n- another strong woman mm-hmm. fighting the good fight um and and questioning like these institutions that we trust. I ask everyone for their pick for podcast hall of fame submissions when you are inevitably entered into the podcast hall of fame for your second season of verified. Is there a singular piece of audio you would hope is playing there at the hall of fame, uh, podcast hall of fame kiosk for verified? Hmm. Oh, that's tough. Um, take your time. In episode five, Marvin talking about his mom and uh, you know, he, he lost J- his mom, Jackie, who he was really, really, really close with, and how he decides to continue to the fight against Johnson & Johnson, even though he really didn't want to because he just wanted to grieve his mom. But he was like, you know what? This is what she would have wanted. My biggest thought process was that at least now going forward, you know, think of the, the countless number of lives that are probably going to be saved by um, taking this product down. So that that just, you know, fills my heart with, you know, so much joy and, you know, I only wish that my mother was here to see this. Natasha, it is the last five minutes of our podcast. You probably don't know this because no one listens to the last five minutes of our podcast. Um, <laughs> no one listens to the last five minutes of any podcast. They're just too right. long. And by then you finished whatever you were doing while multitasking. And so this is just our time to do whatever. Sing a song, recite poetry, reveal a secret, whatever you'd like. And I'll go oh. first. Last five minutes. No one's listening. Talk about whatever you want. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, the uh, haunted asylum my friends and I used to visit um, in Limerick, Pennsylvania, Phoenixville. And Wait, we, what was it? This is a haunted asylum we used to visit. A haunted as asylum? Yep, yep, yep. It was, a, it, was a, it was an asylum, an insane asylum. Remember, they were all shut down. The Kennedy administration was like, get out of here. We're not doing this anymore. This is crazy. So they just closed all these buildings. Uh, maybe it was the Kennedy administration. I don't know. That's a story I've been telling myself for years. But they were just, it was this huge <laughs> campus. It was this huge building. And then, and then underground tunnels connected all the buildings. So you can get up into the buildings from these underground tunnels. And it's like, 17 18 year olds this was like oh my god you can't believe it. like you just go in there and you'd walk around and discover all this crazy stuff there were like wheelchairs we found like pictures of you know when the place was in operation That's and so cool. it was so wild yeah we went a couple times more times than we should have for sure because they were like uh there were all these signs saying danger <laughs> Uh, yeah. asbestos. Like, oh, that's where we're going. They were like, danger, asbestos. And no. anytime you'd run into security guards, they were like, don't go in there. There's a ton of asbestos. You know, you can't, you can't be in there. And it's like 16, 17 year old kid. You're just like, yeah, whatever. Sure. Asbestos. <laughs> okay. You just don't want us to have fun. And so I'm thinking about, you know, listening to your podcast and, and, and I'm remembering we like, you know, take our video cameras down there and I'm remembering the videos and you know, when I'm, when, when you watch them, it's like snow is falling in there. There's just so much like dust and probably asbestos in there. And you're inhaling. And I'm just inhaling it. it. And so when I live a short life, you know, we'll Enjoy know it. why. We'll know why. Enjoy yeah. it to the max. <laughs> Enjoy it to the max because too much urban exploring. I'm done. Guys, if you're urban explorers, please just wear your mask. You know, wear your COVID mask for crying out loud. That's my. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wear your COVID mask. Just wear your mask. I've really enjoyed the mask, I have to say. I, I find it liberating. Warm little face blanket. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for I warm little it. face blanket. I feel cozy and yeah, it's nice. Well, and you know, you do a different, you communicate with your eyes more, you know, because nobody can see your mouth. So you a have to really smiling. like- A lot of eye smiling. A lot of eye smiling. Yeah. Oh, eye smiling. <laughs> um, I, I feel big like- Big winker. I, I'm a big winker now. Huge winker. <laughs> I have a problem with winking. When I start winking too much, like there, sometimes I'll wink and um, and then I can't stop. And mm, it's yep. very, you're like, yep, everybody's creepy. got that problem. She's creepy. But um, so I'll tell you a little story. Mm. Uh, my cat, um, Suki, who was the cat I had before 
uh, Moira, my current cat is named Moira Rose after Catherine O'Hara's character in Schitt's Creek. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Schitt's Creek's great. Schitt's Creek's great. Yeah. And uh, it helped me get through the pandemic. Like that show, I could just sort of tune out the world. So I had a cat named Suki who was before. And uh, that little cat was like my child and she got kidney, she's a Persian and she got kidney disease. Um, and I had to, in the last years of her life, I had to give her inject fluids to keep her alive because her okay. kidneys were not working anymore, which was really sad. It was, it was a really difficult experience, but you know, when you love, when you love someone, you're, you, I'm kind of happy now that I was the one that got to take care of that little mm. creature in her, you know. Her last moments, her last years, uh, through her life. How old is she? Um, I held her when they they put her down, um, and it took me it took me three years. If this was three years ago, it took me three years to kind of get over it. You know, I'm not over it, but like to to decide that it was time to ha to get another kitten. Mm. Um, so I got a, a kitten that's um, that's another Persian, and I named her Moira Rose because she's a little. <laughs> She's a little nut, nutty, kind of like Catherine O'Hare in, in Schitt's Creek. And so I'm in the process right now, but it was a, it was a big deal. It was a big step yeah. to get this, yeah. this little kitten. And I'm in the process right now of trying to get the cat and the dog to, to know each other. <laughs> it's not easy, though, because the cat weighs one pound, 1 1.7, one pound and seven ounces, and the dog is a 50-pound dog. Um, so I'm, it's... This is what I've been doing since the podcast ended on Monday. We we may well I'm, I imagine we'll do some update episodes. Mm. Um, but since the podcast ended, I have been trying to introduce my cat and my dog, and it's a very very slow process and trying to get them to be friends. So that's after we get sounds off our beautiful. Call. It sounds like amazing therapy after dealing with the weight of this pod. Just focus on the singular task. I got to tell you, when I am not doing this work, it could be you could, you're really spending a lot of time on hard subjects, months and months, sometimes years, on depressing subjects, subjects mm. that are important. Yeah. And you're doing a great public service. I think with this podcast in particular, um, uh, our first season one, which was great, I recommend you know if some if you haven't listen to season one go back and listen to season one because it was a it's a really good story and there is um it's fulfilling it's a satisfying mm. um you know these women they fight back um to take down this cop so that's fun but um this one in particular i feel like is just a great public service yeah. um and like you said nowadays our information we get headlines that come on our phone but we're not really there's so much information that mm. you know one of the things i like about podcasts is you can you can go really deep on a subject and and really learn the whole history and background and in, in through a story um and so with this one in particular i mean it's a tough topic but um you you learn a lot so i'm i'm happy i get to do it i just it's depressing as shit have you heard <laughs> from anyone on the pod any of your characters since it's been released? Dean Berg and Marvin Salter both um, let us know that this was, uh, that they, they really, you know, this was really moving to them. So, and that's also incredibly <laughs> important to us yeah. to make sure that we got it right and that we're uh, accurately portraying their story. This is Hasha. It's no surprise that you chose Marvin for your Hall of Fame. I also chose him to uh, bring us home to, to end the episode. Uh, I'll uh, play a little bit from Marvin uh, and his uh, uh, speech before the House Intelligence Committee. But before I play that, I just wanted to say again, thank you uh, for thank you. You know, being a part of this pod and for sharing it with us for today. It's been awesome to chat with you. Thank you for getting the word out. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all your great questions. You're a fantastic interviewer. I've really enjoyed talking to you today where yeah. can everyone uh, uh everyone can listen uh, on all the all the major sort of yep podcast Spotify, apps yep. apple podcast get it where you get your pods kids stitcher wherever you listen <laughs> yep cool they lied to us all they knew the cancer risk associated with their products but chose to cover it up instead they protected their products and profits while putting innocent lives at risk i ask that this body use whatever power in its disposal 
to assist in bringing about justice for my mother and for all women and family who, are, who have been adversely affected by ovarian cancer caused by Johnson & Johnson baby powder. Thank you. This has been the Pod Spotter, where we showcase the pods that you definitely need to know about. But if you have one that we should know about, come on, turn the tables on us. Let us know. Give us a shout via the podspotter.com or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram at the Pod Spotter. Pot spots, spot pods, rather, for us or pot spots. This has been Zach Robinos. The Pod Spotter is created by the Price Brothers, produced by Oink Inc. Radio, associate producer Tori Adams, and is recorded and produced at Baker Sound in Philadelphia. Philadelphia.